today? Well, that's on the screen, so that's easy. Any other guesses? Lacey, do you have a guess? No? Hmm. I can't believe no one said it. Anyone? Did you guys even ever go to Sunday school? Jesus. Always. Wait, guys, if anyone ever asks you a question and you don't know the answer, just say Jesus. He's the, always the answer. Most often in this life, we, we, we live according to what's next. You know, I'm going to start my work week tomorrow. Friday's only five days away. Christmas is coming. Oh, I'm excited for a company to come. I'm excited for my birthday, which, happy birthday, Danny. And actually, this is like a super birthday week. Happy birthday, Jim. Both gyms. Oh my gosh, Melissa's birthday's coming up. Kenzie's birthday's coming up. My birthday is on Thursday. I mean, this like August is happening. Yeah, Melissa. So we're all excited for our birthdays. Anyway, that's kind of some of the point of what I'm saying. But anyway, we live our lives according to that. And um, in, in doing this, it, it kind of contradicts an opposite spirit of, of some of the influences and, and circles that we're in that talk about carpe diem. Seize the day. Make the most of your opportunity. Whatever moment you're in, just take uh, uh, it all in for what it's worth. Whether it's you're raising a, a family <laughs> or I'm just laughing at Lacey. I'm sorry. She, they have a lot going on with their three little ones right now, but they're killing it. Your guys are killing it. Good job, guys. And we try to make the most of our, 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 of our opportunities because it's so important. But yet we live in a society that's always looking for the next thing. The problem with looking for the next thing, the next holiday, the next for graduation year and all these things is that we miss out on what's currently happening right now. And this is something that we try to implement in our lives where we would take our moments and make them count. And that's why we do family vacations and we take pictures and we um, spend time with our children and spend time with friends. This morning, I'm going to preach out of the book of Revelation. And I'm, I'm believing that as I do this, we're going to get a fresh revelation of Jesus. Because when we translate this way of living, of always, always waiting for the next thing, into our spiritual walk with Jesus, we miss out on one of the main revelations of Jesus himself. I declare this morning that we will see him in a new light today. I declare a breaking in the spirit of the different realms of warfare that's been attacking you and me. And I release an encounter with the very presence of God in the form of Jesus himself that will translate into your life, that will bring breakthrough to your situation in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter one. It's one thing I just kind of want to make a point of before I get going is I'm going to read a lot of scripture. Um, it's, it's really what I feel to do. Also, it's very important in the book of Revelation to read it out loud because the, it says, and we'll read it in a moment, that you are blessed when you hear the words of this book. So it, you're blessed when you read it, but also when you read it out loud because then you're hearing it. So we're going to do that. So basically, you could read the whole book of Revelation. You could not understand one word, and you're blessed at the end. So whether you understand it or not, just go ahead and read it and put that into your quiet time. Revelation chapter 1, time is just about up. A revealing of Jesus the Messiah, God gave it to make plain to his servants what is to happen. He published and delivered it by an angel to his servant John, and John told everything he saw. How blessed the reader, how blessed the hearers and keepers of these words. 
I, John, am writing this to the seven churches in Asia province. All the best to you from the God who is, the God who was, and the God about to arrive. And from the seven spirits assembled before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, loyal witness, firstborn from the dead, ruler of all earthly things. The master declares, I am A to Z, the God who is, the God who was, and the God about to arrive. I am sovereign strong. I, John, with you all the way in the trial and kingdom and passions of patience in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of God's word. It was Sunday, and I was in the spirit, praying. And I heard a loud voice behind me, trumpet clear and piercing. Write down what you see in the book. Send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatra, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned and saw the voice. I saw the gold menorah with seven branches, and in the center, the Son of Man, in a robe and gold breastplate, hair blizzard of white, eyes pouring fire blaze, both feet furnace fire bronze, his voice a cataract, right hand holding seven stars, his mouth a sharp biting sword, and his face a pyrigi sun. I saw this and fainted dead at his feet. His right hand pulled me upright. His voice reassured me, don't fear. I'm first. I'm last. I'm alive. I died. But I came back to life. See these keys in my hand? They open and lock death's door. They open and lock hell's gates. Now write down everything you see, things that are and are about to be. The seven stars you saw on my right hand are the seven branch gold menorah. Do you want to know what they mean? What's behind them? We do. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The menorah, seven branches, are the seven churches. All right. Revelation chapter one. The God who is, the God who was, and the God about to arrive. Revelation is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Revelation is not to be avoided. Revelation is not to be made fun of. Oh, it's all these weird symbolism things. Or even obsessed about, like, we need more preaching on Revelation. Revelation is meant, just like any other book of the Bible, to be read and studied and learned about because we are blessed when we, when we do. Revelation is where we get the unveiling of Jesus Christ. If we can get a fresh revelation of the revealed Christ in our hearts and minds, it will transform our hearts. When our hearts are transformed into Jesus and him in us, he can be fully manifested through us. When our hearts are within the likeness of Jesus, we experience oneness with him. And out of our heart flows everything else. John is on an island. He was in the spirit and he was communing with the father and he heard a great voice behind him like the sound of a trumpet, a clear, piercing war trumpet. I'm not sure what a voice like a trumpet sounds like. Did I ever tell you guys about my pinkish tan blanket? No. Oh my gosh. What a great opportunity to do that. When Craig and I were in college, um, Craig's dad called one day and he said, uh, Craig, someone from the church wants to give you, Renee, a gift. And we're like, oh, that's cool. And Craig's like, what is it? He's like, it's a blanket. Like, oh, that's great. We're just starting out. We just got married. We could use a blanket. Like, we need everything, you know? So Craig's like, well, I said, I was like, what color is it? You know, just curious. And Craig's like, what color is it? And his dad says, um, well, hmm, let me take a look at the blanket for a second. Just give me a second. She's like, this is very easy question. Like, just what color is the blanket? Is it blue? Is it red? Is it black? Is it white? Like, what color is the question? So he takes a moment, and then he comes back on the phone, and he's like, it's um, pinkish tan. Craig, he, he repeats it. It's pinkish tan. I'm like, it's pinkish tan. What? 
what is pinkish tan? Like pinkish tan is not a thing. It's not a color. It, there, there is, I don't even understand what that is. I can't picture pinkish tan. I'm like, that's it? Craig's like, that's it? This pink, yeah, it's pinkish tan. All right. So anyway, we let it go. We let it go. Um, we were like, we'll, we'll just wait for it to arrive. So we waited. There was a couple of weeks. They were sending it in the mail. And um, we, we made so many jokes about Craig's dad, if he's listening. And the pinkish tan blanket. And you know how, like, something starts to be a little kind of funny, but then the more you joke about it and the more you talk about it and the more you make fun, it gets, like, hilarious. Like, it just goes on and on. Well, this went on for weeks, all the jokes, everything about this pinkish tan blanket. So a few weeks later, we get the blanket. It shows up in the mail. We're like, this is going to be funny. Now we get to really find out what color this is. We pull it out of the package. And we pause. And we're just staring at the blanket. And then we just stare at each other. And we're like, oh, my gosh. This blanket's pinkish tan. Like, there is not another word in the English language that could accurately describe this blanket besides pinkish tan. Craig called up his dad. He's like, you nailed it. That's a color. That's a thing. You invented it, but it's real. Pinkish tan. Anyway, really ridiculous story just to say that sometimes you just got to be there. So I feel like that's the voice, like the war trumpet. You just had to be there. So here is John. He's in the spirit. He's with Jesus and all his glory. He sees him. He's wearing this robe. His hair is like wool, like snow, and eyes flash, flame, like a flame, a fire flashes. In his right hand, he's holding the stars, and he has a sword shooting out of his mouth. John sees all this, and in the flash of the moment, he drops on the ground like he's dead. Just a couple weeks ago, I was in service during the end of worship, and um, both pastors, Craig and Barry, were up here, and they were doing something, and uh, worship was still happening, and it was a powerful time, and suddenly, no one was praying for me, no one laid hands on me, I was just standing there by myself, and suddenly, I just laid out on the floor, it just happened. It it wasn't quite like a drop, but it was like a stumble and fall, I'm just... This stuff's real. This stuff's real. These encounters with the Lord are real and powerful. Well, this happened to John. He just drops to the ground like he's dead. And then Jesus, power touches him with his right hand and releases a word of peace. He says, hey, don't be afraid. It's okay. You are okay. I hold the keys of death and hell. I am the first and the last. And now that you know you're going to be okay, could you please get up and write something down for me? What he was going to write down was words to these churches that Revelation goes on to talk about. And there's several. We're going to look at potentially five, depending on how much time we have and how long I go. But I'm time with myself, so don't worry. And um, we'll see how far we go. But we're going to look at Five, hopefully. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. John was given words to write down concerning these churches because there was a war against them. And his words were to bring revelation and inspiration. It was a way to bring light onto the situation, but also to decree a change or a move to action. The first church we're going to look at is Smyrna the suppressed church. This was the war against oppression. Chapter 2, verse 8. Write this to Smyrna, to the angel of the church. I just want to point out that they're writing to the angels of the church, which not to the, the board or the pastor or the deacons, but to the angel. So that's interesting. Every church had an angel. The beginning and the end, the first and the final one, the one dead and come alive speaks. I see your pain. And poverty, your constant pain and poverty, but I also see your wealth. And I hear the lie and the claims of those who pretend to be good Jews, who in fact belong to Satan's crowd. Fear nothing in the things you are about to suffer, but stay on guard. Fear nothing. The devil is about to throw you in jail for a time of testing, 
but it won't last forever. Don't quit. Even if it costs you your life, stay there believing. I have a crown ready for you. Are your ears awake? Listen. Listen to the wind words of the Spirit blowing through the churches. Christ's conquerors are safe from devil death. This is the message, if, you weren't, if you're wondering. The word Smyrna means myrrh. This is one of the spices that was used in Israelite religious rituals. To get this fragrance from the plant, you had to beat it and press it. The Christians during this time had been beaten and pressed. They will, they've been ruled by 10 tyrants from the time of Nero until Constantine the Great. This time ended the worst of persecutions. Christians were burned, they were beaten, they were crucified. They were cast to lions and they were tor tortured to death. Thousands and thousands of Christians over a period of 200 years. You see, God's saying, I see you where you are. That was not a small statement, considering what they were going through. The God who is was perfectly acquainted with their pain. And he's perfectly acquainted with yours with their struggle, with our struggle, with their pain and with our pain, with their lack and with our lack. He's also 100% uh, aware of the reality of your true wealth in him and what you have access to. See, he's with you, he's for you and about to save you. So he announced to these people, he said, even the middle of your suppression, I'm declaring future hope. For you and over you. See, your father this morning is on guard and he's waiting to pull you back up out of your situation, out of your suppression. Even before your problem takes on full effect, he's already there waiting on the other side of it. He's already waiting to reestablish you. I know before we moved back here to California over three years ago, we were very excited to come, of course, but if anyone's ever moved, you know that it's one of the most stressful things you can go through. And there was a lot hanging in the balance uh, between finances and medical and um, immigration and all the details in our kids, uprooting them and putting them in new systems and schools and, and all these things. And we had just done it not that long before. And there's all this stress that comes with a big move. And I remember spending time with the Lord just in my quiet time. I mean, God, like, I really want this. Like, we really want to go. But I'm just feeling the stress and the weight. And I remember him reassuring me, Renee, I'm with you here, but I'm also waiting on the other side. Like, I'm already there in San Diego. I'm already there waiting for you. I have the housing situation worked out. I have the finances. I have the medical. I have the school, the kids. The, the, I have it all worked out. He's with you here and he's already down the road waiting for when you get there even through persecution being suppressed by life or your circumstance you're going to be okay maybe the enemy has been trying to take you out but the enemy is no match for the god inside of you he is not an equal fighting partner to god you are bigger, you are stronger, you are greater than he is because of who lives inside of you. The revealed Christ, Jesus, the Bible says has overcome the entire world. It also says that as he is, we are. So we have actually overcome the world. So we just need to reinforce that victory and not buy into the lie, but declare the truth of the word. War back against oppression in your life. The second church, Pergamum. Pergamum was the wavering church. Verse 12, this was the war against compromise. Write this to the angel of the church. The one with the sharp biting sword draws from the sheath of his mouth and out comes sword words. I see where you live, right under the shadow of Satan's throne. 
But you continue boldly in my name. You never once denied it, even when pressure was at its worst, even when they martyred our friend, my witness who stayed faithful to me on Satan's turf. He said, I was there. The God who was, I saw it all, the struggle, the deep loss, the deep loss of your friend. But why, he says, do you indulge in that Balaam crowd? Don't you remember that Balaam was an enemy agent sent to sabotage Israel's holy pilgrimage by throwing on holy parties? And why do you put up with them who do the same thing? Enough, don't give in to them any longer. I'll be with you soon and I'm fed up and I'm about to cut them in pieces with my sword words. This is the God that it's about to arrive and things are about to change. He's like, I know you've been through some stuff, but you're better than this. You're better than this. He says, I'll give sacred manna to every conqueror. If you'll just stay true to my name, I'll also give a clear, smooth stone inscribed with your new name, your new secret name. See, when life is at its worst, God is at his best. Because he is continually and infinitely at his best. There is never a moment where God is not at his best. There is never a moment when he will give you his leftovers. He is not so drained with Craig's problems this week that he doesn't have time for yours. Candy didn't need so much attention this week that he just doesn't have any left over. He can meet every need of all of us all the time. He is continually and infinitely at his best. See, the word is you've done well. That's the word to the church, and maybe it's the word to you. Under the worst of circumstances, you've stayed true, and that's a good thing. But in this one area, you're weakening. Maybe you're just tired. Maybe you're just exhausted from just trying to stay true all the time, trying to be loyal, trying to be faithful, trying to show up to this, to that, to something else, trying to be a good friend, trying to be a good mom, trying to be a a good son or a good daughter, trying to get my homework done, trying to show up to school on time, trying to get to work and do a good job and be nice to my boss and all these things. Maybe, Maybe you're just tired. But it's saying, I... I get it, but you're dabbling, you're messing around in these areas where you shouldn't. You're indulging in places that aren't good for you. You need to hang in there. He says, I'm coming and I'm going to rescue you. See, the God about to arrive is about to arrive. He's coming. The sword in mouth God is about to arrive. Don't give up. You're almost there. And soon you're going to get what's coming to you. And I promise you, it is all good. What are you getting? Well, you're going to get some sacred manna. (laughs) Yay. What's that? Sacred manna was reserved for, for only conquerors. And you get a smooth stone with inscription of your name. You guys are like, wow, this is great gifts. Like, what does it even mean? The hidden manna was referenced to the manna given to the Israelites in the wilderness. It was their nourishment, their sustainability. It was also miracle food. This was amazing. See, the believers in this city were involved in pagan feasts. And during these feasts, they would eat food that was sacrificed to idols. And they would commit sexual immorality. The message here is stop doing that and for those who do and make a commitment to stay true to my name under your situation, I'm going to give you a bigger banquet in heaven. I'm going to give you hidden manna. I'm going to give you sustainability. I'm going to give you miracle food. I'm going to give you exactly what you need for when you need it. This is intimate. This is, suggests a divine personal exchange. That stone with the inscription of your new name, speaking something new over your situation, over your life, that's special and intimate. A free, fresh exchange with Jesus himself. The white stone in John's day 
often signified legal charges being dropped. So that's pretty significant. It's also fitting to mention that in the Greek athletic games, a white stone was given to the victor in a contest or, or even uh, to the gladiators at the Roman games if they had won over public admiration and now they could retire. They got a smooth stone. I also love the fact that the smooth stone was what David used to kill the giant Goliath in his life and to rescue his nation from this tyranny. Make the commitment to Jesus to just leave that stuff behind, to have your charges dropped before you, your victory celebrated, and your giant slayed. Because that's what you got coming to you. So what enemy of war in my life, ask yourself the question, needs a stone between his eyes? The new name inscribed on your stone also speaks of your distinctive new character as a believer who has course corrected and now made new and staying true to your identity as a son or daughter. This is significant. This is no longer am I going to stoop down below who I am, but I'm going to live up to where I know I should be and who I truly am as one with Jesus himself. See, the war against compromising your life has already been won. It's already been won. So now we need to live it. The third church, Sardis. Sardis was the on-move church. This was the war against apathy. <laughs> Revelation chapter 3, write this to the angel of the church, the one holding the seven spirits of God in one hand and a firm grip on the stars of the other. He said, I th see right through your work. You have a reputation of vigor and zest, but now you're dead. You're stone dead. Up on your feet, take a deep breath once again. Maybe there's life in you yet. But I wouldn't know it by your busy work. Nothing of God's work has been completed. Your condition is actually desperate. Wow, is anyone feeling that? <laughs> if you're like, that's me, that's not a good feeling right now. Think of the gift you once had in your hands and the message you heard. Grasp it again and turn back to God. Because if you pull the covers back over your head and sleep on, oblivious to God, I'll return when you least expect it. I'll break into your life like a thief in the night. You still have a few followers of Jesus who haven't ruined themselves wallowing in the muck of the world's ways. They'll walk with me on the parade because they've proved the worth. Conquerors will march in the victory parade. Their names in the book of life. I'll lead them up and I'll present them to my father, he's saying in his angels. See, which side of Jesus do you want to arrive in your life? Like a thief in the night or leading the victory parade? <laughs> Because either way, he's going to arrive. And either way, he's, you're going to come face to face with him. We get to choose which way. It's not up to fate. It's up to me. And it's up to you. And he'll arrive one way to me and maybe one way to you. But it's up to me and it's up to you. How do we want him to arrive? Either way, he's coming. Some of us walk through seasons, and maybe you're in one right now, where you are dead. You are on move. It's like literally nothing moves you. You can be in the middle of a, a fantastic worship service, and you're like, I feel nothing. We are cold, dead Christians, talking the talk, maybe even portraying to walk the walk. But inside, stone dead. It's like a going through the motions Christianity. I'm telling you what, family, it's not enough. It's not enough. The command here is to get up, stand up, fight back, war for your life, war for your spirit life. You don't have to live that way. You do not have to be subject to your circumstances. You do not have to wallow under the weight of the world. You can stand up and fight for your spirit life. Our life with Jesus should be crazy, full of adventure, passion, fun. Don't pull the covers back over your head and sleep on. The alarm goes off. This could be it for you right now. This could be your alarm. Get up. Don't just talk the talk. Quit just walking the walk 
allow the living, active Spirit of God to get into your life and breathe on you once again. See, to be unmoved in your relationship with Jesus is living below your level of revelation. Dead life with Jesus is an oxymoron. And it's so below you. I'm calling you higher today. War against your apathy. War for your spirit life. The next church was Philadelphia. Philadelphia was the steadfast church. This is the war against weak. Revelation 3, starting at verse 7. Write this to the angel of the church. I see what you've done. Now see what I've done. I've opened a door before you that no one can slam shut. You don't have much strength. I know that. You used what you had to keep my word. And you didn't deny me when things were rough. And I watch... And watch as I take those who call themselves true believers but are nothing of the kind. Watch as I strip off their pretensions and they're forced to acknowledge it's you I've loved. Because you've kept my word, I'll keep you safe in the time of testing that will be here soon. I'm on my way. I'll be there soon. Keep a tight grip on what you have so no one distracts you and steals your crown. I'll make each conqueror a pillar in the sanctuary of my God, a permanent position of honor. Then I'll write the names on you, the pillars, the name of God, God's holy city, the new Jerusalem, and my new name. See, he's got you, is what he's saying. And he's got me. He sees it all, all the endurance, all the fight, everything that you've done, the perseverance. And he's about to bring promotion, is what he's saying. He's seen what you've put in, the time you've put in. Don't grow weary in well-doing, family. Your father is proud of you. Those desires in your heart, they're coming. They're coming. I know you're like, well, I've heard that before. Well, we're closer today than we were yesterday. But don't demand it. Wait for it. Keep a tight grip on it. See, the father doesn't miss anything. All the volunteer hours you've put in, every act of service, every time that you've, you've done something when no one was looking, the trash you picked up off the floor in the worship center, the time you fed the homeless, or the times, the weekly times, the time you, des you decided you were going to respond in love to a situation when you could have went another way. He sees the time that you volunteered and you really didn't want to because you just volunteered for three weeks in a row. But the ministry was in the crunch and it needed your help. He hasn't missed a thing. The encouragement is to be faithful, to be loyal, to continue being true as a son or a daughter because he's proud of your consistency and I'm proud of your consistency. Here as you give to Crosspoint and the things that Crosspoint reaches out and City Hope and our food ministry and all those things that you guys have your hands in. See, sometimes we just need a minute to refresh and then we can keep going. Refresh on the goodness of the Lord. We need to focus on the goodness of the Lord and not what's wrong in the church and in the world. We need to find our joy in Him and turn our affections towards Him. See, it's so easy to find all the problems. But to turn our affections and our gaze to him in the middle of the problems, that's hard, but it's worth it and it's fruitful. Our spiritual muscles can build through our fatigue if you give them time to regain and if you feed them what they need. Starving them, wishing that they would replenish on their own, giving them junk food, or hoping someone else would come along and feed them, that's not going to work. You'll be tired, you'll be disappointed, and you'll be confused. Eat the meats. Some of you are like, well, I'm vegetarian. That's okay, too. Eat the things that you need in your life. The meat of the word. Feed yourself. Get into it. Take the time to refresh your spirit and rest in the goodness of God. War against the weak. War against the temptation to quit. This is the last church, Laodicea. 
Laodicea was the stale church, the war against average. He said, write to the angel of the church, I know you inside and out and find little to my liking. You're not cold, you're not hot, and it's better if you were either. You're stale, you're stagnant, you make me want to vomit. You brag, I'm rich, I've got it made, I need nothing. But you're oblivious that the fact is that you're a pitiful, blind beggar, threadbare, and homeless. Here's what I want you to do. Buy your gold from me, gold that's been through the refiner's fire, then you'll be rich. Buy your clothes from me, clothes designed in heaven. You've gone around half naked long enough, guys. Buy medicine for your eyes. From me, you can see then, really see. Is anyone familiar with that uh, old song, Light the Fire Again? You know that one, Lazy? Yeah. You want to sing it? Yeah. I am here to buy gold. We're finding the fire, naked and poor. No? Oh, man. Well, the course goes something like, I am here to buy gold. We're finding the fire, naked and poor. You know what? Wretched and blind I come. Clothe me in white so I won't be afraid, ashamed. Lord, light the fire again. Okay, I'm just telling you what. I sang that song my whole life as a teenager. And then I became an adult and I'm like, what am I singing? I don't even know what that means. I'm buying gold. I'm naked. I don't have any money. I'm blind. And I want fire. I... It has to be the strangest thing if you have no concept of what it means. We're going to unpack it a little bit so you'll know what it means. Verse 19 says, The people I love I call to account. Up on your feet and run after God. I stand at the door, I knock. If you hear me, call and open the door. I'll come right in. Conquerors will sit alongside me. This is my gift to conquerors. Listen to the spirit words, the spirit blowing through the churches. Laodicea was 45 miles southeast of Philadelphia. It was a wealthy city with banks. It had a textile industry and a medical school. This city also, though, had a very sparse water supply. This played into the message of the church. See, God speaks to us in our language and what we'll understand. So he's talking to them about water and money and wealth and clothes and things that they would understand because of the industries. He said cold water, they understood, was refreshing. Hot water, they knew they needed for their medical purposes in that city. And they also understood because of their sparse water supply that if it was lukewarm water, that's not, it's not going to be what we need for our city. The works of the church here, it said, may God want to vomit. See, Jesus rejects the half-hearted efforts of self-satisfied Christians. This church had self-diluted. It was wealthy in material possessions and assumed, oh, we have it all. We need nothing. When really it was spiritually impoverished. They had well-clothed people, all the brand names, but spiritually naked. They thought because we could see with our physical eyes, we have a great medical system here. They thought they had visual into the spirit when in reality they were spiritually blind. Christ's message, buy, receive the spiritual gold and the white garments from heaven to exchange their blindness for healed eyes in order to reconnect with the Father again in the spirit. He was calling to war back against the average, to war back against what's gone wrong. See, average is is the worst. Average is the worst. You cannot live an average best life. You are remembered as the first one to cross that finish line with your hands in the air and everyone's cheering. You're remembered. You're also remembered if you're the last one to crawl across the finish line and then vomit at the end. But for the 90-something percent, that crosses in the middle, average, no one really remembers. Now, in a race, that doesn't matter because the point is you did it and you went out and did something well. But in our spiritual life, it matters. 
it matters. Average is the worst. See, the God who sees, the God who is, sees us exactly where we are but calls us higher because you're better than that. We must war against average. The most prevalent and unassuming detriment to every person is the belief that average is good enough. And this is where we're going to wrap up today. The God who was has never left through our spiritual highs and spiritual lows. Through your compromise, through my missed opportunities, through your moral failures, through mine, he hasn't left. And he hasn't stopped believing in us. The God about to arrive eagerly awaits for us to take the blindfold off, to step out of apathy and to re-engage. See guys, it takes very little to believe and to have faith for the God who was because it's in our memory banks. We remember all the things that God did. It takes very little faith to believe for the God about to arrive. It's like, well, tomorrow I believe he'll do this. It's like a continual putting off. But to fully understand and believe in the God who is. A present now God that in this very moment, right here, right now, this second, this very moment, that he will come and he will shift and he will move my situation and he will provide the breakthrough and the miracle and what I need right here, right now. Now that's a new kind of faith. The God who is. The revelation of Jesus, the God who is. The revelation, the new understanding, the fresh touch, the encounter of the God who is. This is a war of the mind that will proceed from your heart once it's been transformed because what the heart reveals, the mind will produce. Can we believe for that? Do we have revelation of a present God? The present healing, the present miracle. That he is indeed here right now to shift your situation. Can we move into that and stay there? The human heart is at the very throne and citadel of God. And when he moves in, heaven begins. Because that's where the change starts. The Father looks to transform our hearts through encounter and through revelation. As he is, so we are. And in him, we live, we move, and have our being. Let's stand. The call this morning, as we conclude, is to have an inside-out change. To, rem- to, to move from just remembering the things he's done to believing for the things he's going to do. But shifting to understand he can do something right here, right now. Because once we have this revelation, it can lift your oppression now. It can refresh your commitment now. It can fuel your passion now. It can bring strength in the weak parts Now, it can light up your spirit fire. It can bring a tenacity to your aspirations. Now, it is a now God, a now miracle, a now breakthrough. It is the war against oppression, compromise, apathy, weakness, and average. And we can believe and we can stand for that as a family, as a city, as a nation, as representatives and ambassadors here on earth. The now God, the revelation of Jesus himself. I'm going to ask before I pray for you all, we conclude today. If there's anyone here and you would say, Renee, I don't actually know Jesus. I don't have a relationship with him. But today I want to have a fresh encounter with him and I want to know him in a personal way. If you're here or maybe you're like, well, I did at one point in my life, but I've, I've just veered so far from the hand and the direction of, of God that I, I, I just want to come back. If you're here right now with every eye open and everyone looking around, just raise your hand at me if there's anyone here. And you would like to know Jesus this morning for for the first or second time. For those of us here that want to war back against 
these spirit wars in our life. And we want to take control of our spiritual lives and walk in communion with Jesus as the God who is. If you're here, raise your hand. All right, let's raise our hands all over this room as I pray and release the goodness of God over your life. Father, I just thank you for your goodness. Jesus, I thank you that you're here. Jesus, I thank you that you have been revealed from start to finish in the service today. That we started with your name and we're ending with your name. Jesus, 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 Jesus. I thank you that before I even got up here, you were revealing your name in a new, fresh way. The God who is right now in our situation. Jesus, you are the name above every other name. You are the name we stand on for every name need that we have in our life and every breakthrough that we need to break through. So I just release right now over every situation. If you have a need, just begin to call it out to Jesus right now. For every situation, every healing that's needed in a physical body right now, just go out and call out your need. He can do it. I don't need to touch you. No one needs to touch you, but Jesus touched this morning. So I just pray right now for every need. Every ailment in your name would come under the alignment of the word of God that says by his stripes, By the stripes of Jesus, we are healed in your name. For every emotional deficiency right now where you have felt weighed down by the weight of the world because of something that's happened to you or something that you've happened to, in Jesus' name, I pray for a lifting of that that weight and that oppression and that suppression in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that you would come in like a flood and raise up a standard against the enemy and the war back against our life. I pray for the financial breakthroughs and miracles that's needed right now. Go ahead. If that's you, just reach out to him. Just reach out to him. Because the the Bible says that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It also says it's within reach. So we can reach up to heaven right now. We can pull down the finances, the jobs, the breakthrough in your name, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for every need I haven't mentioned. Everyone, you know them all. You know the deepest needs of the spirit and soul. You know what we need before we know we need it. You are the God who was. You are the God who is. And you are the God about to arrive. So I just release your peace, your goodness, and your presence in your name. Come on. And everyone said. Thank you.